Derbyshire, Baroness Jenny Chapman, Labour peer, who's Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, Ash Sarker, Contributing Editor for Navarra Media, and Adam Hawksby, Deputy Director of the Onward Think Tank. The number to call to submit your question is 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 and you can say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. And as of, I think, last week, you can WhatsApp your question, yes, you really can, to 0345 6060 973. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question. With Ian Dale, this is LBC. Right, um, let's go to Peter in Haringey. Hello, Peter. Hello, Ian. Yes, and my question is, what is wrong with bringing some additional controls on protests, like limiting the frequency or having to give a bit more notice, like an additional week? This is on the right to protest. Uh, we've been talking about this in the last hour. James Cleverly um, has suggested that the Free Palestine protests, uh, protesters have made their point and the policing minister, Chris Philp, is seems to be hinting that they might extend the, uh, the, the notice period from six days to 14 days. Um, Ash Sarkar. Well, the first point, which is about the specific reasons for these protests... Palestinians in Gaza are saying, do not let us die in silence. Do not forget about us. And while Britain is still manufacturing arms components, which are being shipped off to Israel to be used in the West Bank and Gaza, while Britain still provides diplomatic cover to Israel internationally, then clearly the protests haven't made their point to the government and there's still a legitimate cause. When it comes to the principle of the right to protest, the fact is, is that the government can't change the rules just because they find protests embarrassing and annoying. That's kind of the point. You can't limit the right to protest. Was, James Clevy was making the point that they've cost £25 million pounds of taxpayers' money. It's putting an enormous strain on the police. I, d I don't think it was the reason that you were suggesting that. I think that the reason why the cost is being talked about in that kind of way is because it is embarrassing to the government. The government is well out of line with the tenor of public opinion on this particular issue and every weekend where there are protests it shows that gulf between the people in power in Westminster and what people on the streets are thinking. Lee. Well there's a uh attention of rights here, right? There's a, we absolutely all support, I'm sure we will all say in a moment, that we all support the right to protest. We do. At the same time, the right to protest isn't absolute. You wouldn't be allowed to protest so nobody could get about their daily life. You wouldn't be allowed to protest so that nobody could pick up their medicines, get food, go to school. So there's a, there's a balance that needs to be struck and we always need to come back and look at that balance. And what I think James is indicating is that um, you know, there's been a, a, a large amount of protests over the last few months about Palestine. That is a legitimate thing to do in principle. There's been some pretty unsavoury stuff, if I'm honest, in practice, including as recently as last Monday. So we've got to strike the balance between allowing protests to happen, whether we like it or not, whether we like the subject matter or not, whether we agree with it or not, but also being clear that unacceptable stuff should be enforced against. And there are other things like the cost that you've just referenced that needs to be considered in the long run. But when he says, OK, you've made your point, you don't need to do more protests. I mean, if the Home Secretary in 1910 had said, Mrs Pankhurst, you've made your point, you really don't need to do it anymore, and the suffragettes would have laughed at him. Well, again, it's, it's a balance, and James is trying to say... And it's trying to adhere to that absolute concept, whether it's in 1910 absolute principle or in 2024, that people have a right to protest, but also making a broader point that there is an implication and an impact on protest. And I don't think that's an unreasonable thing. The other point is that we've seen over the past few years, not just the principle of protest, but we've seen a, a small group of people, a small group of activists, try to use protest as a pressure point. Now, you know, people can make decisions, but ultimately the government has to respond to those. You know, there's an explicit group of people behind Extinction Rebellion, as was, who have decided that protest, that they will protest in a particular way to try to stop daily life in order to try and force the government to change course in an undemocratic way. So I've got to recognise protest has slightly changed in the last few years. It's proportionate for the government to look at it. I was trying to remember who was Home Secretary in 1910. Anyone know? I'm thinking it might be in Herbert Gladstone. So text me on 84850 <laughs> if you can tell us who was Home Secretary in 1910. Um, Jenny Chapman, the right to protest, do, do the rules need to be changed? Well, my understanding of this is that <clears throat> the police have the 
the powers that they need in order to be able to do the job of policing protests effectively. They have a very difficult task, um, which I think most of us can appreciate about making some very finely balanced judgments there on the ground in response to what's going on. But I have to say, looking at the way that Home Secretaries think that making these proclamations publicly is going to be in any way helpful. Um, it, the history doesn't bear that out. You know, we had Suella Braverman trying to tell the police um, how to run the police and how to do their job on a day-to-day -day basis. That didn't work out too well for her. And now James Cleverly saying, you've made your point, please all just pipe down and go home. I just don't think it's going to have uh, the reaction that he, he may have wanted. I think it's, it's not helpful. It comes across as being a little bit patronising. And I just... I don't think Home Secretaries really add anything when they try and try and manage things this way. It is far, far better to leave operational policing to the police and let them use their, their judgment. But presumably, the reason that Chris Phillips seems to have hinted that there might be an increase in the notice period from six to 14 days, I imagine that must have come from the police saying, we think this would be a good idea. It would give us more opportunity to prepare properly, to get the well, number of people in place. If that is the case, let's hear the justification and let's discuss it. I'm very pleased that we live in a country where we are able to protest freely and to be able to express our views. And, and often there are protests with which I fundamentally disagree, but I wouldn't want to be in a situation where they were prevented from doing so. I absolutely agree that you should never, ever stop emergency vehicles, you shouldn't be using intimidatory tactics and by and large that isn't what happens. By and large people are protesting quite peacefully and getting their point across and I think to be fair to the police they do a very good job um, of, of keeping law and order. Um, two rival nominations for Home Secretary in 1910, Winston Churchill, says someone, and Herbert Samuel, I think it was Herbert Samuel, I knew it was a Herbert. Um, Adam, let's come to you. I'm going to dodge that specific question. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of, as Lee predicted, I think that the right to protest is a fundamental part of British democracy, and I get quite nervous when you hear Home Secretary saying, I think they've made their point now, that's not mm. their judgement to make. Uh, and I also don't think the cost is necessarily the main problem. Abstractions are a huge problem, right? We've seen shoplifting go up in communities across the UK, low-level crimes. That's partly because a lot of the officers that would be looking at some of those challenges are taken away every weekend to look at protests. That's, for me, a bit of a problem. I also think some of the conduct on these protests has meant that I've got Jewish friends, I'm sure we all do, that are nervous about going into central London during the weekends who are self-conscious about getting public transport on some of the days when those processes are taking place. That, for me, is a concern. But the bigger concern than some of the marches on the Saturday uh, is the conduct uh, of some of the protesters outside of those events, whether that's at the homes of MPs or at their constituency officers, whether that was outside Parliament uh, recently. And my worry mm. is that that is starting to seep into our political culture. We saw recently Harriet Harman say that we should maybe move to remote debates again to get away from some of those threats and those protests. That is really troubling to me because free speech and the right to protest an absolute part of our democracy, but threats and intimidation that mean that our democracy changes should not be part of how we do politics. And that's the thing I would really like to see the Home Secretary and his team focus on. I think there's a, that's a really good point. I mean, this issue about um, protesting outside MPs' homes. Well, we've actually got a, a question on this, so let's go to that question now, and then I'll come to you then, Jenny. It's from Farhad in Morden. Hello, Farhad. Hi, Ian. Hi. My question um, to the panel is, why is it that it's OK for the MPs to knock at my door and ask for my vote, but I can't knock at their door when it's something so important like this ceasefire? I, I, I can't knock at their door, but they're, they're allowed to knock at my door for my work. You, well, I, I think that... You should say Jenny was an MP Yes, before. I was, and I've also Do people knocked... knock at your door? Occasionally, yes, because... Does that spook you a bit? No, it never did, because um, people are being friendly and they've come because they want to ask a question or they need help with something, and that's absolutely fine. I've also knocked on thousands of doors while out canvassing, and... The difference, I would say, is that if you asked a canvasser to please leave, they will leave. And by and large, protesters don't want to do that, not the protesters that are going to MPs' houses. And, you know, it's quite unusual, it's quite rare, thankfully, that that happens. But I, I think it's a, it's a 
backward step. I think it's bad for our democracy. It stops people wanting to put themselves forward for election. And that's a, that is a problem. If we have a situation where our elected officials are afraid, where it's affecting their voting behaviour, the way they conduct themselves in public life, I think that is a problem. It's deeply damaging. And I am pleased that the... Uh, that uh, senior representatives from all of the parties in Parliament have been to see Speaker Hoyle about this and that I think the police are starting to do more to take care of um, elected representatives. It's, it's, it's not good for our society to have intimidation in elected office. Just a bit of background to this. The Home Office announced, I think yesterday, a new £31 million package to improve security for MPs, which could include providing bodyguards to those MPs who could be at highest risk, whilst also taking measures to protect the offices and homes of MPs. Labour Shadow Justice Secretary Steve Reid and the Conservative backbencher Tobias Elwood are among the MPs who've seen protests take place outside their homes in recent weeks. Um, Lee, when you first decided to go into politics, I know you were a local councillor before you became an MP, did you ever think we'd get to the point where this kind of security would be needed? No, and I hope that we can get away from it pretty quickly because you know my, my constituency i'll be honest with you is um i'm, I'm very lucky I, I don't have many of these issues and long may it continue um but i know from colleagues who have said to me explicitly that you know they're stopping doing things they're stopping uh, going to places they're stopping being as accessible as they possibly can be that is not good for democracy so if you go back to farhad's question which is you knock on my door why can't i knock on your door well you know, I'm afraid you have to separate those two things out most people want to see their MP whether to tell them off or to say they're doing the right thing but at least have the opportunity to do that every Friday night almost I have a village meeting around my constituency to give people the opportunity to come and tell me where I'm doing well or where I'm doing badly or how we need to do things differently but I think we've got to recognise that um, I, I ask for no, no sympathy whatsoever as an MP and never have we've got to recognise that MPs though are, are human that they're entitled to a private life, they're entitled not to be intimidated, and the basic principle, going back to the previous question, is the mob doesn't win. And if the mob is knocking on your door, that's a problem. You've got to have the space in politics to be able to make considered decisions, vote on them, and not feel afraid for doing I that. I think there's a bit of a conflation of issues going on here. I'm someone who receives their fair share of death threats, and I don't take that lightly at all and I don't care what political position you stand for I don't care how much I disagree with it harassment abuse intimidation threats violence it is absolutely never acceptable what's happening at the moment in politics is that legitimate peaceful protest is being conflated with harassment intimidation threats and abuse so to give you an example of this happening a Labour MSP in Glasgow you know tweeted quite dramatically about protesters storming the constituents uh, the constituency office there being threats, it being completely outrageous. And then when footage emerged, because a reporter had been with the protesters, there had been no storming of the office at all. You had some pensioners quietly holding up signs inside the office. You had some chanting going on outside the office on the street. And the police said, actually, there'd been no reports of, of any storming of the constituency offices at all. So what I see going on here is, I think, quite a deliberate conflation of things which are totally unacceptable, such as making people's homes an unsafe space. I think that's completely unacceptable. Harassment, threats, abuse, completely unac unacceptable. And something which is an entirely legitimate protest, which is a, a constituency office, is, is a legitimate political site. You see, we weren't I, talking about offices though, Ash. I mean, oh no, I, but Adam you know, mentioned offices, and I think you'd mentioned offices as well as homes, and so I'm saying we have to draw a distinction between these things. But I think most people do. I mean, I don't see that conflation in the conversation that we've just had. I think we've been very clear but about But the Labour MSP did. But we've been very clear about the right that people have to protest, and we want to welcome it and protect that. That there is a big difference, though, between that, um, which is the vast, vast majority of people who want to get their point across to politicians, and it, I, you know, they have every right to do that. But there is a massive difference between that and threatening your children. Do you, do you agree that it's OK, a, a political party office is a legitimate place for people to protest, either outside or inside? As, as long as it's done in a calm, reasonable manner, of course it is. Just bearing in mind... Well, you were changing, shaking no, your head. I, 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 
become, I'm, I'm from a part of the world where, there, where we traditionally we protest a lot. One of the reasons I'm in the Conservative Party is because I don't think protest is a particularly effective way of making a change. I chose the party. I come from uh, my family are Labour and I, I come from a Labour family, but I chose the Conservatives because I just think you work with inside the system. People have every right if they want to do that. I don't think it's a particularly effective thing to do. I have no problem with people standing outside my office. I think it's a bit of an odd thing to do, but, you know, go for your life, do as you wish, as long as you're not intimidating people coming into that office. I think when you're going in the office, all you're doing is you're getting in the way of a group of people who are trying to help constituents on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be for housing, benefits, welfare, whatever, and you're just slowing them down. So, you know, if your intention is to make a point, you can do that. You can do it without getting in the way of some really important well, I remember things. in, must have been about 1984 when I was at university, and there was big protests about um, uh, student grants at the time. Loans hadn't even been thought of at that point. And the student union decided that they would uh, occupy the local Conservative Party office in Norwich. And the, the party agent rang me up saying, oh, can you come down and sort this out? We've got all these people here. And I, I went down, and it was all very peaceful. Nobody's causing any trouble. No, there was no damage or anything. And all they wanted to do was to bring the situation to the attention of the local media. And they thought, well, this is the best way to do it. And from their point of view, mm. it worked. And no one was hurt. And, and they, they were very careful to tidy up after themselves when they left, which is very British. And I'm extremely relaxed about some of the protests that might be targeted at institutions, right? Like, again, when I was at university, every time a, a military contractor did an event, you'd have people that covered themselves in blood and lied on the floor. Again, not how I wanted to spend my undergrad, but some people choose to do that. That was I me. Think the difference <laughs> that, almost certainly was. The difference <laughs> is that when that... Uh, violence is targeted at individuals, right, and individual decision makers, and particularly in a context where sometimes that violence has tipped over into not just threats and intimidation, but actual physical violence um, and murders in some instances. And to be clear, those have both been from uh, Islamist extremists, from the far right, from a range of different groups. So this isn't a kind of party political point, but the difference in that intimidation of an individual is that it can and does tip into violence as opposed to a symbolic protest against an institution. Now, um, we have the answer to who was Home Secretary in 1910. Uh, Winston Churchill replaced Herbert Gladstone in February 1910, so I was right. Oh, I'm glad you Herbert, that up. Herbert Samuel was Home Secretary in 1916. Uh, the things you learn on this programme. And there's another thing you're about to learn. Two of our panellists appeared together in a Midsummer Night's Dream on the stage when they were 10 years old at primary school. Can you guess which two? I'll tell you in a moment. It's the 19 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Hey, Harry.
but this is it. I'm really pleased that there now seems to be a bit of an arms race between both parties on who can have the better offer on, on house building. Because sure, you know, the, the nature of the tenure when I buy a property is important to me. But frankly, having one that is in a, a price range on a, an average London salary is is more important. And I am you know pleased that there have been warm words from Labour on this. I struggle to see some of the detail about exactly what they would do beyond redesignating parts of the Green Belt. I think they're going to find that very tricky. Some of their own MPs will have opposed sites that have been on Greenbelt land, and particularly if they gain some seats in kind of leafier parts of the country, that's going to be a huge problem for them. But you can't get away from the fact, and Lee will probably be the first to admit, that the Conservatives needed to have built more homes over the past four or so years, and I really hope there's an acceleration in the next year, whether that is going to be in cities on brownfield land or on some Greenbelt land that is redesignated. We need to be building more homes. Ash. So I think that reforming leasehold or abolishing leasehold is just one part of a much bigger puzzle. But the leasehold system is completely bananas. And I'm not talking about flats where there are common areas and you've got to work out a system of ownership for that. I'm talking about houses. So you can have two houses next door to each other. One's freehold, one's leasehold. And for the freehold, you buy it. You pay off your mortgage, you're fine. For the leasehold, at some point, you may be on the hook for vast sums of money and you don't really know why. It's not a system which I think is particularly fair. So I think dealing with that is going to be one part of, you know, sorting out what is a completely dysfunctional housing market. I think that another thing that we've really got to think about is rent affordability. London is one of the worst cities in Europe for rent affordability. If you want to only spend 30% of your salary on renting a one-bedroom flat, and that's what's defined as an affordable rent, you'd have to be earning over £90,000 a year. Now, Spoiler alert, that is not the average salary in London. It's more like £31,000. How have we gotten in this state? I think, one, you know, the rental market has just been a complete cash cow. And secondly, you've had a massive transfer of wealth from public into private hands in the form of right to buy. One in three... Uh, properties bought under right to buy previously council houses are now buy to lets. So that is just a massive transfer of wealth into private hands. And no government since it was introduced by Margaret Thatcher has built enough council houses to deal with that huge transfer of assets. OK, we'll move on to some other subjects in the next half an hour of the programme. It's 8.31 on LBC. Time for the news headlines with Charlotte Morgan. A man's been jailed for at least 36 years after being found guilty of one of Scotland's most high-profile unsolved murders. 51-year-old Ian Packer was convicted of the murder of 27-year-old Emma Caldwell, who went missing from Glasgow in April 2005. At least one person has died after falling from a boat in the English Channel. French authorities also say two other people are missing. And an independent investigation has cleared Red Bull racing boss Christian Horner of inappropriate behaviour. He'd always denied the claims made by a female colleague. LBC weather, heavy rain moving southeastwards overnight. A mix of clear spells and blustery showers in the north, a low of freezing. This is LBC. It's the...
T5 to 9 on LBC. With us in the studio, you just heard the voice of Ash Sarker, contributing editor of Navarra Media. Adam Hawksby is deputy director of the conservative-leading Onward Think Tank. Am I accurate to say? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Good. Uh, Baroness Jenny Chapman, the Labour-leaning, well, very much leaning, uh, Labour peer who's... <laughs> why did I say that? <laughs> who is shadow <laughs> cabinet know. office yeah. minister. Where are you going with that? Uh, Lee <laughs> Rowley is conservative housing minister and MP for North East Derbyshire. Right, David in Enfield is next. What's your question, David? Hi. Uh, good evening, panel. It's been over six and a half years since 72 people died in the Grenfell fire. How is the removal of dangerous cladding from other buildings going? Well, I guess that's really directed at you, Lee. Um, it's a uh, well. We're moving, and over I think it's over 800 buildings now have been fully completed in terms of the cladding that have come off those. The most dangerous buildings, they're almost entirely off. The Grenfell style cladding, the ACM cladding, it's almost entirely off. We're down to just a handful, um, and then we're working our way through the rest of the buildings. For buildings that are very high, we've we're I think over half now are either completed or underway. And then last July we opened for the mid-rise buildings for 11 to 18 meters. We opened a new scheme. Now, actually, we're finding we're having to go out and find buildings to do that. They're not coming forward as quickly and as, as we not? were hoping. So. We're not sure, and it's why we've we've flipped what we're doing um, in the department, along with Homes England, who's delivering it, to go out and physically find them and to, to try out, you know, sending out multiple letters, making encouragement for people to do. We've now got hundreds going through, so we're getting there. So there is, as with everything, I would, I would love to wave a magic wand tomorrow and get rid of everything immediately, but it takes time. We're pro prioritising the, the most uh, challenging ones, which we've done, and now we're working through the remainder. How much is this altogether going to cost the taxpayer? Well, there's, an, uh, there's been an estimate of about £5 billion, pounds, but what the government did last March was say to the developers who are still around and who are responsible for this, you did this, you pay for it. And so the, over two... Uh, nearly 1,500 buildings are going over to developers to actually remediate them, and they'll be checked independently to make sure that happens. It's going to cost them £2 billion to do that. So it's absolutely vital, and that's what my boss, Michael Gove, has been doing. We spent a huge amount of time doing it, saying, you know, you made the problem, you saw the problem, and that's what's happening. Any of you three want to come in on this? I mean, I think just very quickly, Grenfell was multiple crises piled up at once. One was the cladding. The manufacturers were not completely honest about the safety of that cladding. Two, the developers, of course, and the, how widespread the use of that cladding was. But I think there's a third issue, which is that the Grenfell tenants weren't listened to. Mm. And when they tried to sound the alarm about fire safety, they were consistently dismissed. And that's because the way of you know, the, the way the sort of governance of the building was structured, it really did disempower those tenants. So as well as dealing with the vital issue of cladding, and I'm glad that you're saying that the government is getting on with it, I'd want to know what changes are being brought in to make sure that tenants are listened to when they've got safety concerns about the place where they live. And there's a significant amount of work being done. You will have seen things like AWAB's law, which was about the damp and mould, which was in social housing. And Michael has been very clear there has to be progress on that. You're absolutely right. We have to make sure that for people who live in social housing, that, that when people raise concerns, there is a clear process that makes sure they are discussed and where necessary they're acted on. And I think we've made some progress on that, but there's always more to do on it. Um, Luke has just uh, texted, well, WhatsApp this message. Uh, how are the contracts for removing cladding awarded well uh, how the contracts are awarded well what we do is we go to individual buildings and we do an individual assessment of that building uh, a thing that's fire and risk assessment which comes from a list of people who have the right qualifications to do that and then we help the individual buildings themselves to make a decision about who they want to contract in order to do it so they get support around that process to go out and do procurement and contracting and then to manage that process through with help if they need it right let's move on to chris in stubbington hello chris hello ian and panel uh, one in four children are not toilet trained Teachers have to spend two and a half hours a day helping children who are not ready for school. Should we raise the age of children to start school? Now, the annual school readiness survey of 1,000 teachers and 1,000 parents of reception-age children has found a quarter of kids starting school are not toilet trained. As Chris says, uh, teachers say dealing with this is taking two and a half hours a day. Um... Do you have children, Jenny? I do have children. And um, presumably as a responsible parent, you toilet trained them. I mean, I, 
I think it's very easy to just be quite judgmental about parents here. And, and it, it is, it, yeah, it is. And I am being. Um, I, I'm being very, filtering very carefully what I'm about to say because my children, I'm very sure they're not listening to this right now, <laughs> but they are, they are now 19 and 21 and I really don't think that they would thank me for sharing too oh, much. I on the, no, I won't, I won't. <laughs> They've been through enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think that there is an issue with school readiness. It's not just about toilet training. Um, it's also about the... Um, the gap actually in literacy and numeracy that we're seeing when children start school between those children who may have been to preschool education or who've had a, a great start in life and others who haven't and you find that gap that they're starting school with stays with them throughout and actually widens through their school life. I, I don't think that we should be raising the age at which children start, start school and I would like to see many more um, three and four year olds in really high high quality early education where you're learning through play and you're being socialised and you're you're building confidence and getting those skill, social skills that all children need to thrive. And I think that's the way we ought to be thinking about it. And delaying starting school would only make that gap worse. I think in some Scandinavian countries they don't start till seven, do they? But they have much better um, early years education and access to, to free childcare. Um, for everybody, so it's a very different system. Adam? Um, my sister-in-law's a primary school teacher, and some of the stories that she gives me when she has reception and talks about doing the home visits prior to the kids starting are, are really quite shocking, right? It's not just that children might not be toilet trained, it's that their kind of literacy and numeracy skills, as you say, their kind of socialisation, right? Their comfort when they get into a classroom, their ability to be away from their parent when they go into that setting uh, is almost entirely absent. I worry about the answer to that being that the school and the kind of state takes on that responsibility. I think you need to do a couple of things. One, as Jenny rightly says, make sure there's more child care provision. The government have done kind of half the job there in increasing the subsidies that will go through to providers. What they haven't done is some of the reforms to the market and so making sure that more people can become childminders or, or expand provision in an earlier setting. Um, but I think you also need to support uh, parents, particularly vulnerable families, used to work up in the West Midlands. The black country is an area where you've got some of the lowest levels of school readiness, and that's a problem of poverty, right, ultimately. And so the family hubs that exist that support families that are struggling, I think an evolution of Sure Start centres are a good thing. We should have more of those, and we should support parents in we their We should have just context. had Sure Start. I think that would have been... I think family have the... learned some of the lessons of where Sure Start well, went wrong. There was massive dead weight from Sure Start centres. Oh, well, going hold on a minute. Class, I mean, I, I used Sure Start when my children were young, and I think it was an absolute godsend and it is a great leveller. It meant that whatever background you were from, you know, your children got on together, you learnt a lot and you could support one another. It was about building that support network across communities for parents as well as for children as they grew up. I think that the Tories were wrong to abandon Sure Start. It was only just really starting to, to pay off. Um, I, I very much regret that they got rid of that. The family hubs are fine where you have them. They're good. I'm not knocking it. Mm -hmm. But that network of Sure Start centres where you had services from health, from uh, social services, from education, you had you know, great activities going on, dads were involved. You know, that was something really precious that was thrown away far too quickly. Okay, Ash. I'm really glad you mentioned social services because that is a sector which has been completely cut to the bone. Correct. So my mum's a retired social worker. She worked in child protection. One of the things that she noticed over the years of the Conservative governments is that the threshold for intervention became a lot higher. So you had only so many resources, they were dwindling, you had increased need for child protection services because that's what happens when you implement cuts. And so it meant that she would have to triage and only intervene and dedicate her time to the most serious cases of abuse and neglect. So what that created was huge numbers of parents who were struggling perhaps for reasons of mental health issues, maybe they had really troubling backgrounds themselves, maybe for reasons of poverty. And where once upon a time you've had social workers in a supportive role, helping out with some of those things like toilet training or food shopping or making sure that the house was clean and building up the resilience of parents so that they could give their child the care that they deserve. That kind of work just couldn't happen anymore. So the loss of Sure Start is really, really important and so are the cuts to child social services. What, what, what? befuddles me is that sure, if you have a child, and I don't have children, but if you have a child, surely it's obvious to any parent that toilet training is part of being a parent. 
Of course it is. No one thinks it isn't. But I mean, well, well, if you do, they... if you, I mean, I'm not, I'm not playing the parent card here, but. You know, I think most... You're not going to do it, Andrew Ledsman, so <laughs> speaking as a mother. <laughs> yeah, having brought up two boys, you know, I, I, I would not... I'd be the last person to judge a parent whose child goes to school and has the occasional mishap. I mean, that is... It's just sort the of... Occasional mishap, you, you expect that, but it's... No, I, no I, understand the, I understand the point you're making, but I, I think this it comes back to this issue about a wider socialisation of children and these other issues that are going alongside. It's, you know, if we reduce this to just toilet training, we really are missing okay. the point and it's an important point that, um, that the caller raised. Right, a couple of interesting questions coming up. Stay tuned, it's 8.45. LBC. Lee Rowley, Jenny Chapman, Ash Sarker and Adam Hawksby with us taking your calls and texts. Uh, Roberto wants to know, who is Michael that Lee keeps referring to? It's Michael Gove. I will be clearer for the next <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's. Um, we have a cracking fun question at the end, by the way, which I think they're going to get some really good answers to. I'm hoping anyway. Now, uh, Sam says, are Tory ministers banned from using the word Islamophobia? Lee Rowley. No, we're not banned from using any words, but we don't think it's a particularly effective word to use within the context of the discussion over the last few days. We think the definition of Islamophobia has issues, and I know that you know it's, lots of people don't want to get into the exact wording of what it exactly means, but we do think it has issues in terms of the way it's being defined. So we choose to use a different term, anti-Muslim hatred, because we think it's a more appropriate way okay, to well, do is, it. Is Lee, Ro Lee Rowley, is Lee Anderson <laughs> guilty? Choose my words very yeah, carefully. guilty of anti-Muslim hatred. Look, I'm, I'm, I don't, 
I think that Lee has made clear that he thought he got his words wrong the other day, or he, got, he made clumsy it, it's words. It's a question which demands a yes or no answer, really, isn't it? Well, no, because I think this is a pretty nuanced, a pretty nuanced discussion. I don't, I didn't, I didn't use the same words as Lee. I won't use the same words as Lee. Lee has his own choice of words, and he's been clear that he's he's changed some of those words. He's accepted that some of those words weren't the best words to use. I think what we've got to do is all pull back and say there's a whole heap of things in here. One is about protest, which we've talked about earlier. One is about inappropriate protest, you know, the beaming of the from the river to the sea onto the House of Commons, which isn't right. And then one is about a political ideology, not a religion, a political ideology, which is Islamism. And, um, you know, I'll let Lee make his own statements and I'll let him choose his own words, but I'll be very careful with my words. And I think it is legitimate to talk about all three of those. We have to make sure the words we choose are, are correct. It wasn't just a matter of clumsy phrasing. It was a completely false allegation. It was alleging that Sadiq Khan, who is as progressive as they come, let's face it, is controlled by Islamists. And it's difficult to see a reason for why that would be said, other than the fact he is Muslim. Now, Sadiq Khan just plainly is not an Islamist. He also said about Keir Starmer. That, I mean, people who are supporting him are saying, well, he's, he can't be it, uh, sort of anti-Islam because he, he said the same thing about Keir Starmer, who clearly is not a Muslim. And, and again, I think what this has got to do with is the perception of closeness between Labour and Muslims. It's a way in which Muslims, in general, are tarnished with the brush of Islamists whenever they're politically active, regardless of whether or not they're Islamist. And this is something I've got personal experience of. A, a journalist <laughs> accused me of being an Islamist and had to pay out damages when, quite Ooh, plainly, I am not allowed what to say... What have you say, spent it on? Um, I spent it on a cat. <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't a big award, though. <laughs> it was an expensive cat. <laughs> um, like, the thing that I'm saying is that this is a generally used and commonly used slur against Muslims who are involved in politics, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a politician, or whether you're just a voter. And I think we've got to recognise that as either Islamophobia or anti-Muslim hatred, whatever you want to call it. OK, Adam. Um, I was not familiar with the debates around the particular term Islamophobia, the APPG that have put it forward. I've found it interesting, kind of looking into it in the last couple of days, Dame Sara Khan, who's kind of seen as, I think, a pretty neutral voice on this, has herself said that she is worried about the APPG uh, for Islamophobia's definition that they want the Conservative Party to adopt because it would uh, prohibit legitimate criticisms of extreme forms of Islam. That That is something that would really worry me. And so in that sense, I'm quite nervous about the Conservative Party or indeed any party adopting that term. But I think it's really clear that what Lee Anderson said was something that could play into tropes of anti-Muslim hatred. And again, I'm not, you know, you can use the word Islamophobia if it's a definition others are, are, are happy with. Um, and I'm pleased that he had the whip withdrawn as quickly as he did. And I think that contrasts uh, to what Labour did when you had similar anti-Semitic comments on their side. Jenny. Well, hold on a minute. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't accept that at all. I mean, when we had a, a candidate in Rochdale who'd said something anti-Semitic, he was removed within a day. After Pat McFadden had gone out and said that he was yeah, the right candidate. That, with, within a and day, he was gone. And that, that, was you know, that, that is a decision that no Labour leader's ever made before. I don't think any political leader's ever made a decision like that before. That's how... Actually, the Green Party did the same by-election for is the how, same reason. Hmm. That is how firmly Keir Starmer deals with these sorts of things. I think Islamophobia, it's quite obvious what it is. You know what it is when you see it. Um, we saw it in what Lee Anderson said. So, so Jenny, it seems... It's, it's so, excuse, not, me, so, excuse me. Excuse me. You've got to be very the, careful the about your, is your racism. choice of words. It is ra Lee, it is you've racism be very careful about aimed your choice at Muslim of words. people. That is what it is. Well, there's, a, there's a letter Lee Anderson, with 50 people Lee Anderson which has had, said that that definition Lee, has problems. Please. Lee An you but can defend Lee point. Anderson in a minute. I'm, I'm, well, but Jenny, Lee Jenny, now the whole point of this discussion is about being careful and cautious with our words. So that kind of comment is inappropriate. So Lee Anderson has lost the whip, and quite rightly so. What he said was wrong. He hasn't, as far as I understand, Lee might want to correct us, he hasn't apologised for that. So I want to know what Rishi Sunak's going to do about this. Is he going to be allowed to stand at the next general election as a Conservative MP? Well, it's clearly because no, because he's lost the whip. He's lost the whip for now. It's been suspended, as I understand it. There's and, still and a decision to be they've said that he will taken. only be allowed back if he apologises, which he, he said he wouldn't do until his last dying breath. So what's going to happen? I mean, is he going to be a Conservative candidate at the next I election? Be a he, candidate. Should, he should apologise. What he said was wrong, and he's playing into a, a, a nasty racist trope directed it towards Sadiq Khan. I remember what happened when the Tory candidate, when Sadiq Khan was trying to get elected in the first place. This was the playbook. These were the kind of things that were insinuated then. 
And I, I'm very sad, actually, at what's happened to the Tory party. This is not the Tory party that, you know, my nana might have occasionally voted for because she... <laughs> because she, such she, nonsense. No, it's this not. This is absolute no, such Lee, nonsense. No, Lee, trust me. Absolutely I, no, nonsense. Lee, but, please. Uh, what's happened to your party is really sad. It's really sad. I've been part of the Labour Party when we've gone through some very difficult times. I know what it takes to turn a party around once it's gone into this sort of decline. That is what's happening to the Tory party. Absolutely. Colleagues of it's yours... absolutely not true. Colleagues this, of yours are saying okay, so. Suggest, Let Lee come back on that. It's absolutely not true. You know, the, all parties are a very, very broad church. All parties have views in which I don't necessarily agree with, as I'm sure you don't necessarily agree with. You've just gone through a discussion about what happened in, between your party between 2015 and 2020. Yeah, and I helped fix and it. And people have been thrown out of my party for inappropriate views, quite rightly. But the idea, the, idea, the very idea, Jenny, that there is something odd going on with the Conservative Party. It's just the Labour Party, as usual, trying to politicise something in advance of a general election. It demonstrates how the Labour Party, again, will say anything to get elected, have no have no idea what they want to do. It's all just about being elected. Well, I'm that, afraid you're in denial well, that, about that, that, though. That, that all <laughs> got quite spicy, good. didn't it? Listen, we're, we're reaching the end of the programme. Very quickly from Ash, I know you were dying Yeah, to I mean, in. just I, I, one of the things which I find um, quite depressing about this entire conversation is that we look at racism as though it's a party political issue. Labour has an issue with Islamophobia as well. The Labour Muslim Network report found that one in four Muslim members of the party had experienced Islamophobia. More, more than half didn't trust the leadership to deal with it properly. And when you've had, I think, incredibly disparaging comments being briefed by Labour sources to journalists, such as briefing a journalist that Muslim councillors resigning over Gaza was Labour shaking off the fleas, there's been absolutely no action on tackling, I think, a culture within the party of disdain against Muslims. Very quick to point out the problem when it's in the Tory party, much slower to deal with the problem I, I in think Labour's the own ranks. you're referring to, Ash, though, I, I, if it's the report I'm thinking of, it is about four and a half years old, and actually a lot has been done what since then. What about the then? Ford report? Okay. Right. That's about, well, that, that's Listen, I, 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 want, I want to get one more question in, but first I'm going to read out a text from Robbie in Chelmsford. He says, just wanted to say, cross question is peerlessly my favourite hour in the LBC weekly schedule. And tonight's show has been a great example of why diverse topics, reason, debate and great panellists work. Never change, says Robbie. We'll, we'll try not to. So that's a compliment to, that all, random, to all of you. you. <laughs> Rat, totally random. Uh, right, Felicity says, has the government got a vendetta against Prince Harry? Now, the Duke of Sussex has lost a legal challenge against the Home Office's move to stop him and his family being given protection by armed officers from the Met whenever they're in the UK. A spokesperson for the Duke says he will be appealing today's ruling at the High Court. Lee, and if you could restrict your answers to about 30 seconds. Well, I've not watched his Netflix show, but I don't think that counts as a vendetta. I have, don't bother. <laughs> um, I mean, government ministers as, as a convention don't comment on the royal family, so I probably will leave that question. There. But you can, Jenny. I mean, I did watch the Netflix show. Um, I, not as far as I'm aware does the government have a vendetta against Prince Harry, so... Ash? Well, look, I understand that we've got a different system in the UK. You can't just opt in to put the police protection you want and pay for it. You can do that in different countries. What do you think, though, is that, you know, he didn't choose to be this famous. He was born into it. And even when you step back from the royal family, you're always going to be that famous and subject to that amount of threat. And I do think that the state, having made that decision for him from birth, kind of, a, you know, we owe him something. Adam? It would be very easy for him to have... Uh not increased his profile to such an extent in the last few years that he feels he needs that security. He's not someone having stepped away from his royal responsibilities who has uh, shunned the limelight. And so I have very limited sympathy for him, given the media furore he's whipped up, uh, saying that the public should be paying for his security. So, no, I don't think it's a vendetta. Right, our fun question for the end of the programme, which we always look forward to, is from Hattie in Bristol. Monica Lewinsky has become a model for the first time. She's now 50, as part of a campaign by a fashion label to encourage people to vote in the US election. What's the most unusual type of campaigning you've ever done? I'm going to start this one off. When I was a candidate in 2005, I had to compare a professional wrestling match in Sheringham. <laughs> Jenny. Oh, okay. Um, so I was trying to save a local breast uh, screening service in Darlington 
And me and a group of um, women, we decided that the right way to highlight our campaign... Oh, God, what's coming now? Yeah, I know. It, uh, it, I don't know what's in your mind, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so we decided we were going to dress up as Dolly Parton. We did a flash mob with a, a local dancer called Darian Wright. We had drag queens and we did nine to five in a brilliant dance routine. It got loads of media and the breast cancer screening service was saved. That's not what I thought you were going to say, <laughs> but uh, Lee. Well, I got blindfolded um, and walked around my second biggest town in North East Derbyshire so that the guide dogs could show, us, show, show me as the MP just how difficult it is to get around. So that was extremely unusual, but most illuminating thing going because you can just see how different, how differently you, you, you perceive the local area as a result. Adam? While my friends were off in Thailand on their gap years, I was an intern for an MP uh, and went to campaign on a Friday in Woodcroft Wild Space in Winchmore Hill. Thought I was going as an advisor uh, and then was dressed in a full B mascot costume uh, and photographed the Enfield advertiser. Uh, the Wild Space was saved and I think I was the, the key element of that. <laughs> Ash? Okay, well, um, one that won't get me into any legal trouble to talk about is... Uh, protesting Andrew Lansley's NHS reforms and it involved a lot of fake blood and a nurse's outfit. There really is no comment to that. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, um... <laughs> It's a very good one. Right, thank you to all of you, to Adam, to Ash, to Jenny and to Lee. On Monday, uh, we are going to have the barrister and broadcaster Hashi Mohammed on the panel, Reform UK's candidate for London's mayoral election, Howard Cox, and the Tory MP, Vicky Ford, plus one more, presumably a Labour MP. Now, in the next hour, I want to turn to a subject that's always quite a difficult discussion, but whenever we do it... I always feel that many of the calls are quite inspirational. And tonight's discussion has been sparked by Jonathan Dimbleby, the broadcaster, who's described the criminalisation of assisted dying in the UK as increasingly unbearable after his younger brother Nicholas died this month with a debilitating motor neurone disease. And it's a very simple question. Isn't it cruel not to reform the law on assisted dying. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, a man's been found guilty of one of Scotland's most high-profile unsolved murders. 51-year-old Ian Packer has been convicted of killing 27-year-old Emma Caldwell, who disappeared in April 2005. The court heard she was lured from Glasgow's red light district before being strangled and left in Woodland in South Lanarkshire. The government's considering plans to increase the notice period for some protests after the Home Secretary said they're putting